Um, Matthew 15, or 13, if you could turn there. I just love this building. It reminds me so much. We were in a building just like this for 10 years. And before we moved to a school and then ended up in a building that we had for quite a few years. But it's so funny because we had a, a, a room just like this. And then below, ours was a basement. And so some of the kids now that grew up in that, they're, they're, they're married and, and some of them are having kids and stuff. And I'll talk to them once in a while and I'll say, hey, what do you remember about the little church downtown? And their perspective was so different because they always were in this dungeon-like basement. And so that's how they view church. And so I feel bad because they're scarred for life. And, but hey, that's the way it goes, right? And so this morning, we are going to look at the sower and the seed, but I want to look at it just a little bit differently. Uh, most of the time when you look at the sower and the seed, you look at it as though everybody's in one of these categories, and the person speaking will say, which category are you in? What I've learned over the years is that I end up in all of these categories as I go through life from one, one time to another. And, and I end up experiencing all these things. And the older I get, I still have to deal with each of these areas. So I want to look at it not as though you're in any one particular sort of soil, but you're going to go through all kinds of different times where you may fit into any of these categories. The goal is to be the good soil, obviously. But we're all going to face the bad soil. So I want to look at it in that way. So... Lord, thank you for our time this morning. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that you are the sower and you're always sowing seed in our lives, no matter where we are. We pray that you'd open our hearts to see what you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so the first one, verses 3 and 4, and then verses 18 and 19. Verses 3 and 4. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying... Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. And then, if you look at verses 18 and 19, Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then he, the wicked one comes and snatches away that which was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. So the first one, if you look at it, the seed is thrown on hard ground. The first thing we're going to look at is just a hard heart. Just a hard heart. And there's going to be times in your life where your heart's hard. Sometimes you're going to come to church. I've done this even as a pastor. I don't tell people this, but that's how I am sometimes. I don't want to talk to another person. If someone comes up and smiles at me, I just want to slap their little face. What are you smiling at? You know, life is hard. And so, you know, sometimes we just have an attitude. Our prayer life is dry. We're angry. We're just frustrated with life. It's hard. I just, I'm not in a good mood. My, my wife, generally, she is so stable. She just doesn't have very highs and very lows. She's always been like that, unless she's hangry. Do you know hangry? Some of you know what that is. She's got to have breakfast. I don't eat breakfast, but she's got to have breakfast. And I've learned on trips, whatever it takes, get her breakfast. And so it pays off. But hard heart, it can be an attitude. Hosea 12, 10, or 10, 12 says, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. Sometimes we just have a hard heart. Sometimes we can get cynical. I mean, I've lived long enough now. We have a seniors group of about 75 or 100 people in our seniors group on Mondays. We start tomorrow. We call it Marathon. A bunch of old people. And they can get cynical at times. I mean, you've lived enough life to where your, all your hopes and dreams have been dashed. You put your hope in a president or a political party, and it all falls apart. They take your taxes, they, you know, all of these things. And after a while, you, you realize, okay, it's not getting better. It's getting worse. And you get cynical. I mean, most of us over the age of 60 know when a politician is lying, right? When they move their lips, okay? We just get cynical. And we look at life that way. Your heart gets hard. And you forget that these people are loved by Jesus. 
and, and we, we, we just get hard sometimes. Psalm 2 talks about the world wanting to break the bonds of God. There comes a time where they literally just want to be free from God himself. They don't want God at all. So we know it's going to get worse. Psalm 146.3, do not put your hope in princes. And I added, or presidents. I mean, how foolish to think one man is going to change this world around. I mean, we will think that. The world will think that one day. They'll look at one man, think he's going to change everything. And they'll obey him. They will submit to him. They will worship him, actually. But then other times, we start to compare ourselves to one another. Well, how come they have all the gifts? How come they're so pretty? How come they can sit it, fit into a size 34 pant waist? You know, how, why all this? How come everything goes well for them? How come they get to retire and I got to keep working? We start to compare. My youngest daughter has to be one of the prettiest girls I've ever met. Slender, athlete, smart as a whip. She's getting her master's right now and she's going to become a principal. And she's probably going to be one of the youngest principals they've ever had in the Boise area. And she's always comparing herself to other women. And I think, are you nuts? It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter how smart you are. You always have this tendency, and it creates a hard heart. I always read her this verse, too. She says, okay, Dad, 2 Corinthians 10, 12. For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. They're fools. And she knows that verse by heart now, and she knows what I'm going to say. We may think too highly of ourselves. We may think, hey, I'm a good person. I'm doing well. Remember, that's what the Laodicean church said. They were doing well. Everything was going fine. They were doing good. They're good people. They're nice people. They support charities and stuff. But the thing was, they were lukewarm. They had no, they had no excitement for the Lord any longer. It was a hard heart. They had a hard heart. Sometimes secret sin does it. Wouldn't it be horrible <laughs> if, we, if, if, if people could see what God sees about us? If, he, if we could see into the hearts? And sometimes we're just hanging on by a thread because we are trying to control secret sin, but it's there. Now, I look at these things and, and I, I look at the church of Laodicea and the apathy and stuff where God says, remember the parable where the uh, Pharisee said, I'm glad I'm not like other men. And sometimes we say that. And, and, and sometimes I think it's Calvary Chapel. I remember you feeling that way. We're not like that church. We're not like that church. We start to feel it, a little bit of pride and stuff. And so all of this creates a hard heart. Now, I can give you verses till you're blue in the face, but it's never going to change you unless something happens. The antidote to this is one of the most beautiful words that I've ever read in the Bible. I've come to see it as one of the most beautiful words in the whole Bible. Repentance. Now, some of us think of that, oh, great. Now he's going to condemn us. Now he's going to just hammer on us that we got to repent and grovel. You know, I have a small group of guys. We meet every other Thursday. There's about eight guys, eight of us. And um, one time we were talking about the word repentance. And I said, when you guys think of repentance, what do you think of? And, and how do you look at it? And you know what? I said, how many of you think of it in a negative way? And you know what was interesting? Every one of them did. Every one of them thought of repentance as in a negative way. And, and I can understand that. I can understand why we think that. And, and so just a little bit about repentance. First of all, what it's not. It's not promising God that you will never do it again. You can't make that promise. It's not trying to make up for it in good words. Lord, if you get me out of this situation, if you help me, I promise I'll go to Sunday school every week. Or I'll go to church every week. I'll even laugh at Jim's jokes once in a while. I will try. You know, we, we, we make promises. Lord, I'll make up for it. Or, or it's not trying to forgive yourself. I hear so many people, oh, I can't forgive myself. Well, you're right. You can't. You're not the one that gets to forgive you. It's God himself that forgives. Only he can do that. Okay, so if it's such a negative thing, why, why do we look at it that way? I think most, most of it, it's because we grew up under parents that were human. So when they got mad at us, 
We got punished, and it took some time before we felt that relationship get restored. So we knew we were in trouble. And when we look at repentance, it's like we know we're in trouble, and God's kind of upset at us and mad at us, and we're not going to get that relationship back the way it's supposed to unless we make up for it or something. You know what? That's not at all repentance. You know the best picture and the perfect description of repentance in the Bible? And you all know it. It's the prodigal son. The prodigal son. He's repenting. And what happens? All he does is see the mess he made, and he confessed it. He says, I've blown it. I've sinned against my dad. I've sinned against God. Maybe I'll go back and see if I can be a slave for my father or a servant for my father. What does the father do? <laughs> he runs down, kisses him, runs down, loves him, kills a fatted calf, has a party, all these things. You see, repentance is, you probably do it more than you really realize you're doing it. What you're saying is, Lord, my heart is hard and I can't change it. And I'm turning to you and I'm asking you to change my heart because I can't do it. And you're turning to someone who loves you more than anybody on this planet could possibly love you. And wants your heart tender. He wants the ground, he wants the soil tender and fruitful. And so we repent. And that's what it is. I repent often because I know who I'm turning to. I repent often because I know my heart can get hard. I know I can get frustrated. I know I can get annoyed at people and that, that bugs the heck out of me, but I, I can't change that part of me without his help. And I know he wants to change it. And so when you repent, you're turning to a loving God. And so if your heart is hard, hard this morning, if you're in that state, all you have to do is confess it and turn to the one who loves you. And what's interesting is everything the young man was looking for in the world, his father gave him. <laughs> you know, he, he, he was looking for love and his father gave him that love. He was looking for clothing and jewelry and the father gives him a coat and he gives him a, a signet ring. He was, he, he was looking for great food and he gives him the fatted calf. He was looking for partying and his father has, a, has this party for him because he's returned. Everything he, he was looking for was there. The hard heart. The second one is in verse 5 and 6. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up, and because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, and they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And then verse 20 and 21. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who, who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while, for when tribulation or persecution arises, because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Tribulation, the second soil. Tribulation, trials. Who really likes trials? I mean, think about it. Who wants to go through suffering? I don't really know anyone who, I've never read anyone in the Bible that enjoys it. I don't know anybody I've ever met really enjoys trials. I think if I did, I would think that person's pretty messed up, you know, to, 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 to like trials. Look at Job. I mean, when we think about the book of Job, sometimes, I don't know if you've ever gone through the book of Job, but I, I have taught it several times. And sometimes people lambast the wife. You know, she said, why don't you just curse God and die? Well, just think about it. She just lost seven children, all killed. All seven of her children killed. I've been around people who have lost a child. There is nothing that goes deeper than that. She lost all of her kids, probably some grandkids. And then they lost all of their wealth, everything. I think we should be a little more sympathetic towards Job's wife. I can understand why she said what she did. Totally understand why she said that. But the fact is, Job went through it. And as you walk through that book, there's these three friends, and they go back and forth. And in reality, they, they never do give him good advice. They're always convincing, trying to convince him that he must be sinning. That's why he's punished. And he knows he hasn't been. I mean, he knows he's sinful. But, but, but there's no sin that, that comes to mind that deserves this kind of treatment from God. And, and he even says, I wish I would have never been born. I wish I would have been born a still death. 
I wish I'd never come to life because of all of this. And what happens is sometimes when we go through trials, we respond in the flesh, and we've all done it. Instead of going to God, instead of trusting Him, I know people, and, and, and I just, I, I'm talking about all of us in general, we, we try to make it better ourselves. We may grab a bottle of wine. We may self-medicate with pres- prescription drugs, which is a tough thing. I'm dealing with that now in our seniors group because older people are struggling, uh, struggling with prescription drugs because they're getting knee replacements and hip replacements, and, and they've never really had to go through something as painful as that. And I know one guy who was an Air Force pilot, and he's, he got hooked on him, and, and I, I just broke my heart. But there's a lot of ways we try to save ourselves from trials and tribulation rather than trusting God. What's the antidote to that? You know, I think there's a verse in in John, the gospel, that sums everything up that there has to do with trials. It's John 16.33. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. The first thing in that verse is that we are going to suffer. You, you, you have to face that. You're going to have trials. It, it, it's never, you know, if, it, if it's not one thing, it's another. If it's good right now, enjoy it. If everything's good right now, enjoy it. But I bet you, I, with a raise of hands, most people are going through some sort of trial. Either physical, stressful, emotional. Whatever it may be, someone's going through a trial. And the unfortunate thing is, when we're going through it, sometimes we run from God, the very one who can help us, because we're angry that he's letting a servant of God go through this. And basically, that's just pride. It's suggesting that we don't deserve it. I deserve to be treated better than this. And deep in the heart of your heart, you know you don't, right? Right? You know you don't deserve to be treated any better. If Jesus had to go through trials, why wouldn't we? I mean, look at Job 5.7. Man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upwardly. When Jacob was being blessed by the Pharaoh, when he had finally come, Joseph was there. And he says, how many years have you lived? And he says, I've lived, re- I've lived my- the years of my pilgrimage have been really hard and long, but I've lived this many years. He talked about the trials he's been through and stuff. We've all go through them. I ask my daughter, my middle daughter, who gave us the most problems. I said, do you think God paid you back by giving you four sons? (laughs) She said to me one time, she said, I should have stopped at three. The fourth is just, I don't know if, if you do remember the little comics, the, the Tasmanian devil. That, that is, that's Titus. I mean, if you say black, he's going to say white. And he just has that rebellious streak. And is always getting himself in trouble. Trials. Trials. If Jesus had to suffer, so do we. It's just part of the life. It's part of life. You're going to go through it. It's not going to stop. I, I, I've been on the planet almost 70 years now, and it's never stopped for me. I don't anticipate it stopping. I'm already looking at, you know, knees, and, you know, my dad died of Alzheimer's, and I'm thinking, oh, great, that's me in five or six years. So we're already planning for it, my wife and I. And so, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. But again, it, it's not because God doesn't love us. But here's the other part of that verse. In this world you will have tribulation. By the way, do you realize that's a promise? How many of you have that stuck on your refrigerator as one of your favorite promises in the Bible? I mean, we don't, do we? But yet it's a promise just as much as every other promise in the Bible. He promised us this. This is going to happen to you. But then he says, be of good cheer. He says, have hope because I have overcome the world. What does he mean by that, I've overcome the world? What he means is that he's going to take what the world has, is going to throw at you and turn it into good. That's how he overcame it. 
How did he overcome death? By rising from the dead. The worst trial of all. The death and punishment and the wrath of God upon Jesus. And he rose from the dead, overcoming death. And he's overcome the world the same way. He's going to use trials in our lives. He's going to use everything in your life to make you more like Jesus. He tells us in the Word. Romans 8, 28, 29. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. And so the good, the good that He's going to turn it into is transforming you and I more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. That's his whole goal through trials. If it weren't necessary, God wouldn't allow you to go through what you're going through right now. The only reason he's allowing it is because it's necessary for you to become more like Jesus Christ through this. It's necessary for me to go through whatever I have to go through to become more like Christ. And that's the whole purpose of everything that you struggle with. Every striving you go through is to, for you to become more like Jesus Christ. It, 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 it's a lot like a strengthening program. I, I still go to a gym. For what reason, I will sometimes wonder. But, you know, I lift weights. And sometimes, you know, I just don't want my arms and upper body to atrophy. And so I'll lift weights until my, my arms are ready to drop. But what's happening? Even though at that moment they're incredibly weak and I can hardly move them, what's happening to them? They're getting stronger. The same is true of a trial. Same is true of a trial. It's like you're lifting weights and you can't, you don't think you can handle any more. And yet what's really happening is your character, the inward man, is becoming stronger and stronger and stronger. The inward woman is becoming stronger and stronger and stronger. More in the likeness of Jesus Christ. And so it's to help us mature. James 1, 2 through 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. The word for perfect there is mature. That's the work of the trials, to, to, for you to become more and more mature. What is the picture of that maturity? Paul tells us in Philippians. Philippians 4, 11 through 13. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and to know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. To be content. Whether it's trial or blessing. Actually, it ends up that they're both they're both the same. I mean, I've reached a point in my life where I know when trials come, I'll get through it because he's always gotten me through it before. I can be content. I know some are going to last a little longer than others. One of the biggest trials in my life lasted for about eight or nine years. My daughter married a non-believer and I refused to give them my blessing and I refused to perform the ceremony. It didn't go over well. I, I was sort of anathema for quite a while. But it's all changed. My son-in-law would do anything for me now. He loves me to death. And I'm praying. My wife had a vision one time that we would baptize him. And that's what I'm praying for. He loves me. He, they love being around us. If they could, they would move here to be with us. And all because we just kept loving him. But it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy being chewed out by the father-in-law. It wasn't easy by people in the family thinking I was some nutcase whack job that wasn't really a Christian. But I said to him one time, I said, you know, what's weird is you're always accusing Christians of being hypocrites. Then when someone actually lives what they believe, you don't like that either. What am I supposed to do? You know, and so he didn't know what to, to say. So... That perfect work. The trials. Next, in verse 7. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. And then in verse 22. 
Now, he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. The things of the world that entice us. First John talks about the things of the world, lust of the flesh. You know what that is really? We think of immorality. That's not really what it's talking about. What it is, is it's, it's the idea of overvaluing something. It can be very good. It would be just, okay, if you want to use immorality, if we look at sexuality and we want it so much that we're willing to break the commands of God to have it. And so it's overvalued, it's overinflated. And it, it, it can be that way with anything. The lust of the eyes. Something you think will fulfill you. You know, I've never bought a lottery ticket, but I had a guy say one time, hey, pastor, if I ever win the lottery, and he bought a tick, two or three tickets every day. And, and, and he said, Pastor, if I ever win the lottery, you guys are going to get half. And I said, Bob, why don't you just give me the money that you're spending on the tickets? I'll be happy with that. And, and we all think about the lottery. Have you ever dreamed about the lottery? I personally think I would be a really good rich guy. I, I'm generous. I'm nice. I would share with others. You know, I'm thinking, God, why don't you try it on me? And, and I'm willing to give it a shot. And, and yet, it's, it's never, you've never really felt the same as I have. And, and so, again, the lust of the eyes. Anything that you think will fulfill you, doesn't. If I could just own a house. Well, now you do. And you have to keep it up. You have to repair it all the time. And they're raising your taxes right now. And, oh my gosh, I thought I would enjoy it. I just bought a boat. I'm so happy. And then you're not happy until I just sold my boat. I'm so happy, you know? <laughs> you know? I mean, think about it. Nothing fulfills, but that's what the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Again, back to comparing ourselves. Thinking you're superior to others. Thinking that you're in the best group or wanting to be in the best group. Trying to be in the best group. All these things keep us really from God. It, it chokes us out. And, and, and they can be good things. They can be wonderful things. Sports, you know, uh, you, you know, just all kinds of things. I guess one of the ways you can see if you're, if you're falling into this is, does it consume me? Does it just, is it something I'm always thinking about when I have the chance to think? Am I thinking about it? I don't know what it would be. You know, I don't, I don't know what you do. It may be, who knows, quilting. I don't know, my wife quilts, but she doesn't think about it all the time. She just finished one of her big quilts for one of my daughters, and she's glad it's done. And she's not planning anymore for a while, but, but some people do that. Some people, they think about shopping all the time. They think about, or they think about a sport all the time. I just can't wait to get out there. Fishing, hunting, all those things, they just consume us. The second thing is, am I willing to sin to get it? Do I lie to other people about it? Do I have to... Keep it a secret because people are afraid I'm doing it too much or whatever. Am I willing to sin if I don't get it? Am I willing to sin if I don't get it? Again, that, that becomes an idol. That becomes something that will choke us. I've seen so many people seeking the things of the world. They have no time for the body. They have no time for serving. They have no time for prayer. No time for anything other than maybe showing up to church once in a while on the weekend. And then a lot of times, not even that. Because they buy a motor home and say, hey, it's for the family. We go camping on weekends. But I don't have time for church anymore. Church is camping. It's not really. Church is the body of Christ being around people that help you see Jesus through the gifts they have and the ministries they have, the difference in personalities they have. You have leadership in the church that, that God condones and ordains in scriptures. James 4.4, 4, do, not, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Whatever is just taking up all your thing. You, lots of times you can tell what your idols are, what's choking you out by looking at your checkbook and going through, where does the money go? You know, I've always looked at it this way. With animals, you follow the food. With humans, you follow the money. It tells you everything about them. It tells you everything about them. How they use their money. How they don't use their money. And so a lot of times, these are the things. And it's interesting that he used the word choked. It's an interesting word because you know what the word for spirit is. 
the Greek word is pneuma, which means breath. And what happens is when the things of the world get in the way, they put a stranglehold us, and the breath of God is no longer having an influence on us. The Holy Spirit is no longer leading, it's no longer impacting us, because there are other things in this world that are, become more important. I, I only know of really one way. Of course, we can repent of it if we see it, like I said earlier. But I really only know one way of overcoming idols because we like them so much. We actually love them so much. And I've had to be honest with God in my life. I've had to say, I love this more than I love you right now. And I've had to be brutally honest and face it. The only way I know to deal with it is to learn to love Jesus more. Because if you don't love him more, you will always love something else. Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, and the height. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. That you may be filled with the fullness of God. Why would Jesus say unless you hate your mother, father, wife, husband, children, you cannot be my disciple? Why would he say something like that in the Bible? Because he's told us in other places to love them. What he's saying is if you don't love me more than you love them, you will turn them to, into an idol and will not be able to fulfill your role the way you were intended to be because you will overvalue them more than you do God. And you won't love them appropriately. And, and so he makes statements like this. I think the biggest example for us, and, and I know in our country, it's, it's really money. I mean, everything revolves around money. And, and politicians know that. They know that you'll vote according to your, uh, your, your, your pocketbook. It's interesting. Um, I, have a, I listen to a guy who's a teacher, and one of my favorite all-time teachers. I listen to his CDs all the time. And he was talking about this. He did a series on, on the seven deadly sins. And he got to greed, and his wife said, this is going to be your smallest turnout. And he said, no way. And it was. Very few. He had been having 500 to 1,000 people show up. And about 100 people showed up for the one on greed. Because no one thinks they're greedy. We are the greediest nation and people that have ever lived on the planet Earth. We're all greedy. And, and I include myself in that. Because our life revolves so much around money. I hear people all the time, they're taking my money, they're raising my taxes. And I'm thinking, wait, 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 wait a second. Whose money is this? Whose money is this? I actually told God the other day, because my, my, my oh, they raised our, the price of the assessed value of my house. It just skyrocketed. I called my friend who's a realtor. I said, hey, blah, 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 blah. And she said, ah, don't worry about it. It'll be okay. That's just the way the market's going. 20 minutes later, she had gone to the mailbox. She called me and said, I can't believe it. You know? <laughs> but here's the thing. Whose money is it? I told the Lord the other day, okay, if this is the way you want to spend your money, fine. But I hate to, to see you spend it on taxes. But we do. It's my money. Tithing is always a big issue. And I've never totally understood it, but, but part of me does. Tithing. You know, well, I do it with my time. Well, that's not what tithing is. Tithing is giving 10% of the increase of all that you have. And here's what's interesting to me. Let's say, just for the sake of argument, a house around here you could get, let's say a, a four-bedroom pretty nice house you'd get for $500,000. That's probably within the re reasonable, isn't it? Okay, so you can't afford it. Banks won't loan you any money. But your friend, who's really wealthy, says, I'll loan you the money. And, 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 and you're going, oh, all right. Well, how much is the interest rate? And he says, no interest. And he says, well, what's the catch? And he says, here's what I want back. I just want $50,000 back. That's all I want on my return. Not the $500,000. All I want back is, I'll, I'll give you the $500,000. All I want is $50,000 back. Would you not be dancing in the streets? And that's all God's asking for. 10%. And, 
and we act like he's ripping us off. It just shows you how greedy we are. That's, that's all I'm trying to do because I include myself in that. It's hard to write those checks sometimes, especially when times are really tight. But he says, hey, test me. It's the only area where he said, test me. I'll come through. I'll take care of you. And he always has. He always has. And I'm, I'm only pointing this out because if we aren't willing to see what we're really like, God can't work in our hearts. And, and to me, the only antidote to this is radical generosity. The church should be so generous. And in many ways it is. Many ways it is. But we should be more generous. We should live knowing that, that we have to live within a, a, our means so that we can give and things like that. So we get choked out as a result. It chokes our fruit. The last one is in uh, verses 8 and 9. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Um, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then in verse 23. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So, as we go through some of these other, these, these other things, the Holy Spirit always trying to get us back to the fertile soil. That's where the Holy Spirit is taking us, where our soil is fertile. It's like, I'm the potter, you're the clay, mold me and make me. This is what I pray. This is the idea of God being the potter. We're the clay. He wants us to be in that place where we're absolutely moldable. I don't know really any better set of scriptures that describes this than in John 15 where it talks about the vine and the branches. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you abide in me, if you abide in that relationship with me, I'm going to flow through you and change your whole life. I'm going to go through, I'm going to work in you. And, and do you know what that's describing? This is somewhat, somewhat intimidating sometimes, but this is what he's describing. In, in 1 Peter he says, be holy for I am holy. And because I am holy, be holy in all your behavior. What, what do we think of when we think of the term holy? Who's a holy person? Sometimes we think, well, that, that's the, the guy or the girl that they, they just keep all the rules. They're really good people and they keep all of the rules. That's not really what it means, although there are good, you know, we're told to obey the commands of God. If you love me, keep my commandments. That, that's true. There is that. But that's not what he's talking about. Holiness is simply put, you are giving God access to everything in your life. You have given him permission to deal with every aspect of your life. If someone here today can say, well, church is church and business is business, you don't get it. You don't understand holiness. If you're thinking, well, he can have this part of my life, but this is mine. I'm going to do what I want. I don't care what the Bible says. I don't agree with it. Then you're missing what holiness is. Because if there are things you see in the Bible that your life doesn't line up with, holiness is to say, God, I, I messed up in this area. I want to give you access so you can change me and work in my heart. I need you to change me. It's interesting. Pride is one of those big things that most of us need. Some people are overinflated. They're arrogant. They think they know everything. They have the answer to everything. And then you have the other person who feels they're just worthless and don't have any meaning and, and, and life is horrible and they're just, you know, we call it low self-esteem. They're both a form of pride. The, the focus is on you. You're, you're totally consumed with you. And God wants us in that fertile soil where I'm not thinking too highly of myself. I'm not thinking too lowly of myself. I just don't think about myself that much. I'm thinking of others. Others. When you think about others, it's hard to think about yourself. And that's what God wants to free us from. And so, holiness. Unless God has access to every part of your life. Does he have access to your thought life? Does he have access to your tongue? Remember Isaiah, 
When God appeared to him in the temple, he said, woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among the people of unclean lips. I mean, I think we see that on Facebook today. I am ashamed sometimes at what Christians will say to one another on Facebook. It amazes me. How, how could we possibly be like that? Obviously, God doesn't have access to what we say sometimes. And... and, and that's an area where many of us need some work, is, is how we talk to people, how we talk about people. And you know what's fascinating? Is when God judged them for their murmuring, he was saying, and I heard them murmur in their tents, in the Psalms. It was right in their own homes. That's where he heard it. And, and I, I sometimes give myself license inside my home. No one else is going to hear. Oh, they do. The angels of heaven themselves are listening. And we got to remember, we got to give God access to every aspect of our life. That's what the fertile ground is. That's what holy ground is. It's where Jesus... Now, we doesn't mean we've mastered everything. doesn't mean we have victory over everything. But I'm working through it with Him. I'm seeing it for what it is, and I'm allowing Him to work in my life. That's the goal that God has for us. What does it mean to abide? M much of it you're already doing. The early church was a perfect example of abiding. They continued such, said vastly in the apostles' doctrine. They were in the Word, saturated in the Word. They read the Word. They, 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 they taught the Word. They listened to the Word. They, they studied the Word. It was part of their lives. Fellowship. They were with people. They were with people. You can't alienate. The man who isolates himself is a fool, it says in Proverbs. We need people around us. People, we need to have people who see us for who we are. Have you ever played a tape of your own voice? And you think, I don't sound like that. And everybody says, yes, you do. It's the same true as we don't always know how we're acting. And people can point it out who love us. My wife is real good at that. <laughs> Sometimes I'm not, I'm not so happy with it, you know. But yet, I need it. I have friends that will point things out. We talk about things, and they don't do it. They don't say, hey, Chuck, you were being a jerk then. You know, but I had a friend the other day. Uh, well, it's been about two years. But to me, it's the other day. Because <laughs> guess I'm old now. He just said, hey, Chuck, you, do you realize how you came across to, to that lady? And I said, no, did it sound bad? And he said, yeah, pretty bad. And I was just felt like I was trying to make my point. You know, that's what all men do. I'm just making my point. Well, you sound like you're angry at him and you hate him. And so anyway, that again, we need people around us to break bed, bread together, communion, to focus on the gospel, to remember what the gospel's done to us and for us. To always remember that Jesus saved us from our sin and gave us his righteousness. See, I'm not afraid to be honest with God anymore. And, and I hope you're not. First of all, you can't hide anything from him. And secondly, you stand before the Father in his righteousness. You have the 33 perfect year life that he lived accounted to you. All he wants to do now is to help you conform to that. And, and that's the desire of the, of, the, of the area of the fruitful soil. And then prayer. Prayer. To pray. To spend time in prayer. You know, I, remember, I remember when I was a, first, first became a Christian. I was done in three minutes. I mean, I prayed for my family, the world, and world peace. And I was, what else is there, you know? I'm done. And, and, it, and it's grown over the years to where I really do enjoy it now. One thing that changed my prayer life, I think, more than anything else was I remembered a prayer conference. This is the only thing I remember. I don't remember anything else about it. I just remember this one comment. Never pray without reading the Word and never read the Word without praying. That just revolutionized my prayer life. Because now as I read through the Word, I'm praying about things in my life. I'm seeing things. I, I realize there's someone there talking to me as I pray through the Word. It's personal. It's intimate. And I so enjoy it. 
And there's nothing special about it. It takes time to learn and to grow in it, just like you do anything else. That's why Paul says, I learned to be content in all things. It's a process. So, the sower and the seed. Just a different way of looking at it a little bit. I think all of us go through these different things, and hopefully we're all heading toward fertile soil. That's what he wants. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are so faithful to working in our lives and in our hearts. And I pray that you'd continue to speak to us and lead us in all things. Lord, may you be glorified in our lives. And may, as it says in Romans, we continue to be transformed by the renewing of our minds and transformed through the trials we go through into the image of Jesus more and more. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.